So it's specifically about the way that we're using language um, in child sexual exploitation practice and literature. Um, I have started to really think about what we mean when we say vulnerability and what we really mean when we say at risk or, or risk um, in this field. And I feel like the more I think about it, the more confused I get. So I thought if I wrote it all down and then tried to talk it through, that might be a good start. Um, and also other people could use this resource to start conversations and debates around practice and around language especially. So I have written down um, the, the official defini definitions of each word so I can try and think about what they actually mean in um, sexual violence against children um, because I feel like we are using these words and not hearing ourselves say them as if we we're using them and not particularly using them in the way that those words were originally defined and in a way we this field has kind of run off with those words um so they're now being used incorrectly so i so i'm gonna I, the first one, thing i'm going to talk about is vulnerability um so the definition um well there's a few here um, so vulnerability is the quality of being easily hurt or attacked and then they give an example that some high school children think it's funny to pick on younger children because of their vulnerability so if we just stop there so vulnerability is the quality of being easily hurt or attacked so we have in child sexual exploitation these like really long lists of vulnerabilities of these very specific things that we over a period of time have linked with with child sexual exploitation as we know from the you know the work done um by um professor sarah brown and her team at coventry university um we know that actually some of that isn't really bearing out in the data when we actually test it so what what we've done over a period of time is we've seen um a number of cases we've looked at some of the issues in those cases and then and then we've kind of decided that those must have been the vulnerabilities that led to that child being sexually exploited, which is flawed logic, um, unless you're going to talk to every single child in the country and look at all of their vulnerabilities and then whether they got sexually exploited or not. But that is the current way that we're practising. But if we use this definition, the quality of being hurt or attacked, then that's everybody, isn't it? So unless we're going to accept that every single child is vulnerable to child sexual exploitation because they're a child and anybody could target them then we are cherry picking which children are vulnerable and which are not based on stereotypes of vulnerable children so the second part of the definition for vulnerability um, says vulnerability is the state of being open to injury or harm or appearing as if you are now that one really got me thinking because I thought that means then, according to that definition, that there has to be a third, there has to be a third person, there has to be an other. Because for you to be appearing vulnerable to someone, there has to be a someone. For you to be open to injury or harm, there has to be a something else, there has to be. And that means that essentially we can make the argument that the vulnerability is not what underpins the exploitation it's the offender it's the it's the it's the other so that means that there are children right now in the uk with significant vulnerabilities in the way that we currently define it and they will never be sexually abused or exploited because there just isn't a perpetrator there is no sex offender in that child's life so therefore, it does not matter how many vulnerabilities they have, they're not going to get abused. And when you flip it over like that, that I think is healthier for us in practice. I think that's safer because what that means is that rather than us getting fixated on the vulnerability being within the child and then it being our job to in some way reduce all of those vulnerabilities and then those children won't get abused or sexually exploited, instead, what we're accepting is that children will always have a range of vulnerabilities. Their vulnerabilities, as they're currently defined, will change and shape and move and evolve all the way through their life, depending on what's happening for them. But nothing will ever happen to them 
unless there is a sex offender there within their life environment. It is only when the sex offender targets them and it is only when the sex offender begins their offence that that child is then at risk of anything. Because they could go all the way through their life with a number of different issues and difficulties and experiences and nothing ever happened to them. And actually we know that most children never get abused. There is, you know, although we're saying that it's tip of the iceberg stuff, which arguably it is, you can't, you can't really sort of argue against that, it definitely always will be because of disclosure rates and conviction rates and that sort of thing. But the majority of children do not get sexually abused and exploited. But what we can't say about that majority of children is that none of them were vulnerable. We can't make the argument that the ones that never got exploited or abused never had any difficult life experiences and that's why they stayed safe. Because we know that that's, that's going to be flawed. That's, that doesn't make any sense. So I was thinking about how this example actually transfers into practice and one of the things that um, immediately popped into my mind was the way that we're using... CSE preventative education awareness sessions in schools because there are so many organizations and individuals and practitioners either being asked to go in or saying that they can go in deliver these sessions on CSE awareness and um, you know and risk and vulnerabilities and all that sort of stuff and saying that you know it will help reduce their vulnerability but we have no evidence for that we have no evidence that the education reduces their vulnerability at all and in actual fact I was really pleased to see um, a rapid evidence assessment from University of Bedfordshire on this subject looking at whether the education around sex ed healthy relationships and things like that specifically actually have any impact on those children going forward does it change their sexual behaviors does it change their sexual experiences um, does it have any impact on what happens in their sexual relationships in the future, evidence is pretty much saying no. It's saying maybe some tiny effects that are probably more contributed to knowledge than they are to to anything else in terms of like changing their actual behaviours, but that it has no real bearing on their behaviours going forward. Now, you what you could take that to mean is, this argument I was just making, is it doesn't matter what knowledge or education that we give to children, if there is a sex offender that is ready and waiting to target that child and then abuse and rape them the knowledge becomes irrelevant hence why adults get raped and sexually assaulted at similar rates to children because even in adult life when we know what sex is we've had consensual sex we're still at risk hate that term, <laughs> at risk of being raped and sexually assaulted because it doesn't sit within us it sits elsewhere the risk and vulnerability doesn't sit with us so it means that it doesn't matter whether we've always been in consensual healthy relationships it doesn't matter if we have brilliant understanding of sex and and a brilliant experience of sex up to that point if we are then assaulted or abused that was it was never about the vulnerability sitting within us it was never about someone saying well what was your sex ed like? Was it was it any good? Is, is that why this happened to you? Because you didn't have enough knowledge about the difference between rape and sex? No. <laughs> okay, so the second definition um, that I'm going to talk about is risk. So I've got it here. It says, definition of risk. The possibility that something unwelcome or unpleasant may happen. Now this is, I feel this is really important because risk is quite possibly the worst word for this. Vulnerability, I think, with is it has some issues, but risk is way out in front in terms of problematic use of language. Um, and that's and this is why, because we use risk to describe things happening to children that definitely are no longer risks. They are definitely harm. So I'll give examples of that in a minute. But the the definition of risk is the possibility, so like the chance, the probability, the, the potential, the prospect of something maybe happening that would be unpleasant or unwelcome. So in our case, in safeguarding, that would be harm. But we're not using it like that. 
we're calling children high risk. We're calling them medium risk, we're calling them low risk. When we actually already are extremely concerned about those children and we already know that there are other things happening or we know that those children are actually being trafficked and exploited, raped and abused. We know, we know that, but we're still calling them at risk, which is a gross misuse of that word i actually think and i've started to say to people i think it's insulting i think if you were you know for you as, as a person in your personal life if you went and disclosed um, or somebody found out that you had been sexually abused or assaulted or you'd recently been raped and they said mm, yeah you, you're at high risk of of that happening like no it, it it's all it's already it's already happened yes but we're going to put you down as high risk um rather than a victim or a survivor because we have these things that we follow these standardized assessment tools that say you're high risk so the second bit of this definition uses an example which i love and it says do not use the stove inside a tent because of the risk of fire and i feel like that should be printed across the top of every risk indicator toolkit in the country because it reminds you how you actually use this word risk so if we take that example then a lot of the risks on a risk indicator toolkit actually are, are not risks at all so we have um ones that i've seen i mean i've seen pretty much all of them now i reckon um and they say things like being trafficked bought or sold in high risk i don't even know where to start with how wrong that is um being repeatedly sexually assaulted um being trafficked for forced marriage you know there's there's um being coerced into sex being bought items in return for sexual activities um, you know, being given drugs and alcohol in return for sex. These, those things aren't risks. If you're ticking those, you are so far past risk with that child, it's unreal. And actually, at that point, I would be saying, if you ticked anything, really, in the, in the toolkits in the UK around high risk, then the, the conversation about risk has to stop at that point. You, you just stop there. Because your preventative work has either failed or you, or you just didn't get in, you know, you only just found out you didn't, you didn't get in early enough. There was no early intervention and there was no preventative work because maybe you've only just, you know, found out about that child. If you're taking stuff in high risk, this is where I feel preventative educational work does the most damage. Because if you're you know, if you're saying, right, well, I've ticked like a number in, in high risk and a few in medium risk and I think maybe we should sit down and talk to them about consent. I can't think of anything more patronising, quite frankly. And the children might not realise that that's patronising then, but they will figure it out later. And we know this because we have adults now who are exploited in Rotherham, Rochdale, Derby, and, and they're now adults looking back on that practice thinking, eh? Well, I was blamed for that. Why was I sat down and spoken about like to, about sex and and consent? Why was I talked to? That doesn't make any sense. And they they what we've got to remember is the practice that we're doing right now will will affect them for the rest of their life. So if our practice is absolute shite now, they will definitely remember that, and they're not going to trust us in the future. And that quite rightly, if that's the way that they're treated and the way that they're made to feel, why should they? Quite frankly, but they're also going to remember the feeling of somebody working with them that makes it sensitively absolutely clear that the risk came from the perpetrator and not from them um, and that they are immediately accepted as a victim of serious crime and that's another um, way that I've started teaching recently and sort of talking about it is that whenever people are calling children high risk and medium risk and there is evidence that the crime has already taken place or it is taking place or the child is being exploited or abused. I've started saying, so they're a victim of serious crime, as in like homicide and rape and trafficking, you know, serious crime. So those, those children, I would prefer to no longer call them, you know, these, these risk categories because the risk has foregone, the risk has gone now. It also means that we use the term low risk in a rather strange way because um, low risk on the indicators 
actually have in some cases in some places in the country they have some quite concerning things in in low risk um self-harm often sits in low risk and whilst you might argue well just because they're self-harming doesn't mean they're at risk of child sexual exploitation which is correct you, you know there's no there's no real link there that we found it's still a language problem because if you're ticking things like i think um, in low risk it says things like self-harm um poor body image um and like hanging around with friends that may be involved in cse and things like that if you're ticking those things and then you're having a conversation around a table where you all use the phrase low risk yes they're low risk yes this is low risk low risk tick low risk yes this child is low risk so we don't have to deal with this right now you are reaffirming to yourself that 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 there is no risk of harm there whereas actually there is definitely already harm i.e self-harm or there is significant risk of of serious harm there but it's just not cse um and i guess that's one of the issues with having such a specific tool is that it's never really going to work is it because there's children are more than just one issue they are a whole human being so you know when you're ticking things are going oh well don't worry it's low risk of cse and then all the action slows down actually what you've done is ignore all the other things that were going on for that child and the fact that it yeah fair enough it might not be cse but what what is going on why is that child harming themselves what is what what are they coping with what is what is that a mechanism or a strategy for what else needs to happen so risk um, and the way that we're currently using that word positions the problem within the child and we end up with these lists of you know tick lists of um, essentially a tick list of what's wrong with the child what does the child not do that we that we want them to do and what does the child do that we don't like um, and then right at the top I, I would argue those things are are actual you know crimes quite a lot of them um, and I, I imagine people are sick of me talking about this and I don't mind that, to be honest. Um, so why am I bringing this up again? So I feel like we've slipped into like a really comfy spot in this field where we think we know all there is to know and we're using language that is problematic, but we're so used to using it and it's everywhere that nobody is questioning it anymore. That we're, we're talking about vulnerability like we know that there are causal links we're talking about risk like we know that there are causal links but we've got no evidence yet so right now some of this practice is immature and dangerous but because we think we know what we're doing whenever somebody criticizes it it gets shut down really quickly was, uh, the conversation after three girls was really interesting um Obviously, if you, you know that I'm active on, you know, conversations on social media, but I'm also an avid watcher of other people's conversations on social media. And um, it, is, it is extremely interesting watching other people try to make the same arguments that, I'm, that I make. One, it, it helps me not to feel so alone. <laughs> but, but second, they're getting similar responses. So at first I thought, well, you know, if, if somebody makes an argument that you don't particularly like, then you're not going to listen to them anyway, are you? So maybe it's just me. But watching other people make the exact same arguments I'm making about risk and vulnerability and the way that we're victim blaming using those terms and then watching them get shut down in exactly the same way, I've started to think, actually, are we, are we becoming institutionalised? So is this field getting to the point where it's so sure of itself that it can't even take criticism anymore that because if you if we have to accept that we've been working incorrectly and that we've gone down the wrong road with this then then we all have to take a step back and be like mm, yeah we've probably made some serious mistakes here and some people have been wronged quite seriously um and there's going to be a lot of practitioners and managers and academics out there that would be fairly comfortable with that and say, actually, to make sure that traumatised, raped, abused, trafficked children get the right service, I'm quite happy to step back and say, I feel like maybe we've not been doing this the best way that we could. And we've made some very large assumptions that are born out of victim blaming. And maybe we should have a rethink. I think there's a lot of people that are getting to that position. Uh, but I also think there's a lot of people 
that I don't think could handle that at the moment. There's, you know, there's evidence of that whenever people have these types of conversations. So the language is is so embedded now that I feel like we've developed a really socially acceptable way of victim blaming. And I think, again, like the Three Girls um, documentary, the co it was, uh, to be honest, I was more interested in the conversations afterwards um, and the debates and the responses. There was a lot of people sort of talking in past tense, oh, we don't do that now. Gosh, how did that happen? You know, like, um, we don't talk about victims like that anymore. I can tell you now that we definitely do. That's one of the unfortunate benefits of working all over the country with local authorities and police forces everywhere. Is that I know that we do. I see case records that say worse stuff that was in that documentary. I've, I've had to, you know, authorities and police forces have given me examples of them and said, look, can you take these and write them into material so that you can show practitioners that that this is actually their own stuff that they're writing because sometimes I'll go in with my own examples um, and other times um, people that commission me will say no actually we have examples from the last financial year could you use these they've been anonymized could you could you use them as part of the teaching and and the development um, and I've I've done that for lots of different um, commissioners and people and it's quite, I think it's quite a shock for practitioners to actually read their own work back that's been anonymised um, and the tone and the language and the, in, the assumptions that they're making about children and the opinions that they're putting in without, I think, even realising that that's what they've done and then giving them time to reflect on it and really think about how they could have reworded that and the impact on the child of inc just awful recording and sort of judgement of, of them. So I feel like we found this really palatable way of blaming children by either saying that they are um, taking risks, that they have risk-taking behaviours, they have a risky lifestyle, um, that they it's risky behaviours, risky decision-making um, and, and that sort of thing. I think that that is essentially just evolved victim blaming, I've said that before, but I also feel that I'm, I'm watching practice and I'm reading things at the moment where I feel like we're going exactly the same way with the word vulnerability. We're saying things like vulnerabilities that lead to CSE, vulnerabilities that contribute to abuse, vulnerabilities that are, you know, children are more likely to be abused and things like that and I'm like, ooh, careful, careful what you're doing with that word because it's essentially erasing the role of the perpetrator as the catalyst. The perpetrator is the one that converts vulnerabilities into the offence. The vulnerability would never even factor in unless a sex offender was in, in that child's life. It also creates an assumption that all children that are abused by somebody are inherently vulnerable, which we, which is just, that just doesn't make any sense for that to be true. Um, it's difficult to, to study um, because it would mean having, you know, sort of huge samples and being able to study something that doesn't happen, if that makes sense, um, rather than studying something that does happen from case records, which is much easier because the access to the data is there through um, social care records and through police records and things like that so you'd have to find the people that nothing ever happened to and then talk to them about um, their background their lives their histories their experiences and that sort of thing and I think in some ways we can get like dragged into talking then about protective factors oh well they must have had loads of protective factors well no not necessarily what about people that have have had very difficult life experiences not necessarily had the you know sort of stellar protection and, and um, protective factors around them, but still they were never sexually abused. They were never sexually exploited. And and I, I'm absolutely 100% certain that this is because if there's no sex offender targeting that child, they will not get sexually offended against. It's that simple. And this is where we have to start shifting some of our language and some of the where some of our focus in practice. Because we're dangerously close to focusing so heavily on the child that we are erasing the role, the motivations, the choices, the decisions of the sex offender that's actually offending against that child. We've got to the point where we are so obsessed 
with reducing risk and vulnerability within the child, we're ignoring the fact that there is a very large possibility in some cases that you will work to reduce every single one of those apparent risks and apparent vulnerabilities and that child will still get abused, exploited, trafficked, raped, whatever it is, because the risk was never within the child. The risk never came from the child. The risk always came from the sex offender. So that then started me off thinking about um, some of the work that I'm doing. So the reason, I guess the reason that this irks me so much is because I write so much about victim blaming, although all of my work in victim blaming is about um, adults, um, adults that have experienced sexual, all forms of sexual violence. Um, including her you know sort of like catcalling street harassment online everything um and all the different ways that we we find ways to blame them um subtly and overtly and then also how society has taught them all the way through their life that there is there's probably something they did um that that meant it was their fault and i was thinking about this sort of like mood i'm in <laughs> about risk and vulnerability and it made me think about counterfactual thinking, which is something I've written about recently in one of uh, one of my pieces of work. Um, and counterfactual thinking is essentially the thought process that we see in um, victims of sexual violence and, and, and in other people. But counterfactual thinking, especially in sexual violence, is that is that sort of if I hadn't have done this, then this wouldn't have happened. Or well, if only I'd have done this differently, then this won't happen. If I do this differently in the future, this won't happen to me. If I am just different, then this won't happen in the future. And counterfactual thinking has been shown um, in studies previously that in the short term, it's deceptively uh, effective for mental health and for psychological trauma because the victim suddenly feels back in control because they've been told or they think, you know, the reason that you were raped was because you behaved like this or because you were wearing that or because you went and you went and did that. So then they, they take that in and they process it and they think, right, so I got raped because I did that. So if I don't do that, then I won't get raped. And that's when you start seeing lifestyle modifications. So, you, you, you know, we work with um, victims that say, oh, no, I don't go out at night no it's dangerous at night I was you know ever since I was raped I don't go out at night ever on my own and that makes them feel temporarily safer and it can actually help in the short term with feelings about um of, of anxiety and depression and things like that however in the long term it will probably crumble and fall apart because there will be examples of things that happen to them in their life that don't fit within that control so the reason that I've started thinking about counterfactual thinking in child sexual exploitation is because essentially what we're doing is we're encouraging counterfactual thinking. So if we are observing a child um, who is being sexually exploited or trafficked or abused um, or even in familial abuse and that we somehow convince them that we need to work with them to reduce their risk and to re reduce their vulnerabilities and change their behaviours and change how they're acting. Um, and change something about their life, even if we think it's really positive, like getting them back into school, essentially what we're reinforcing is that if they just change these things, they'll be safe. If, it, if they just change these things and do what we ask them to do, then they won't, then this won't happen to them anymore because we'll have fixed all the problems. Now, I guess I'm interested now in, in really thinking about, are we, are we encouraging them in counterfactual thinking then? Are we encouraging them to believe Right now, so I did everything they said, I went back to school, I've stopped hanging around with them people and everything's going to be okay now and everything will stop and I am safe because they've said that I will now be safe. And then two weeks later, sex offender contacts them on Facebook and says, I've got this of you and if you don't do this then this is what's going to happen. We've just like sold them false safety, haven't we? We've just sort of, we've just sort of developed like a fake solution a temporary fake solution and that I think that is is that is where I'm starting to go with this is so I'm thinking like are we doing damage 
Because that would really concern me. Are we convincing people that should they have done something differently, they wouldn't have been sexually exploited? Because before I went into to training and teaching and research and stuff like that, I used to manage a rape centre. And um, I had, I think at one point I had 31 psychotherapists and counsellors. We saw children over 13 and adults, men and women, um, that had experienced any form of sexual violence abuse, um, recent or, or non-recent. And um, I know how I trained them and I know how they were trained and, and they were, you know, they were all different levels of um, qualification up to sort of masters and doctorate. And um, I don't remember ever training them to talk to a victim of sexual violence in counselling or therapeutic support and say, well, you know, maybe it was who you were hanging around with or, you know, you shouldn't have really done that, should you? Like, gone to that hotel because that's dangerous. That was a risk you took. Like we would, we would never ever go down that line of of response ever. Like, I can't think of a, a time I would ever support a counselor or a psychotherapist to say, "Well, you know, you, you, you took this like these six risks, and if you would have just reduced those risks and changed what you were doing, um, then this probably wouldn't have happened to you." Same with vulnerability. I don't ever remember ever training or working with or supervising a psychotherapist who would say like well you know you had all those different vulnerabilities and that's that's probably why that happened to you and it, if you had support at the time to reduce those vulnerabilities um, or if we could work on reducing your vulnerabilities in these counselling sessions then that won't happen to you again like I I know that it's a different field and people are going to say yeah Jess that's 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 therapy though that's counseling but i actually am a firm believer that um social workers youth workers police officers people that are actually dealing with children in significant trauma that have experienced abuse and exploitation kind of already doing that job whether you like it or not unfortunately you are dealing with people experiencing significant trauma and every single word that comes out of your mouth will affect the way that they process that trauma so actually you have to accept that despite the fact that you have very, very different priorities in roles, when you are talking to someone about their sexual abuse or exploitation and their behaviours and what led to it and uh, all the rest of it, what happens in therapy and counselling is what's best for everybody. It's, it's what best, it's what, it, the skills are what is required by everybody, really. Because there would never, ever be a conversation um, in, in therapy and counselling where you would even allow somebody to collude with the idea that it was definitely their fault and that they should have done something differently and actually i'm doing a study on this at the moment i'm interviewing um counselors and therapists of of um, sexual violence uh victims and survivors all, all over the country and already in the data in the interviews it's coming out that even when somebody sits in front of them and says you know if i wasn't that vulnerable maybe this never would have happened to me or you know if i would have just stopped wearing those clothes or stopped hanging around with that gang of friends at the time maybe none of this would have ever happened a counselor will or a therapist will not knowingly sit there and go mm, yeah yes that's right well if you change your behaviors in the future then that won't happen to you. Like there is, a, there's just, there's just no one that I can think of that would say that. But we're doing it, and it makes me wonder whether these um, adults and children that have experienced sexual exploitation and abuse are then later in life, or even like you know when they're children, they're getting into a therapeutic environment, and every, all the counterfactual thinking that we've embedded in them by saying, well, you need to do six sessions on consent and healthy relationships because you need to up your awareness of CSE to reduce your vulnerabilities. And then they get into therapy and the counsellor's going, no, none of that was your fault at all. No, you, that it was all the sex offender's fault. There is, there is no fault that sits with you, no responsibility that sits with you whatsoever. And we're going to work through those feelings now that is an incredibly different approach to what we're taking in, in with risk and vulnerability in this field so then um i think that's enough from me and i finally feel like i've got it out of my brain which is incredibly cathartic um but if you want to talk about it 
um, if you want to get in touch or if there's anything that I can do um, or if you want to just continue the conversation with other people and use this video then that's that's cool as well so thanks very much for listening and I am interested to see what you think <laughs>